Story four of The House with the Mezzanine and Other Stories by Anton Chekhov. Translated by S. S. Kotelianski, eighteen eighty, nineteen fifty five. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Story four In Exile. Old Simeon, whose nickname was Brains, and a young Tartar, whose name nobody knew, were sitting on the bank of the river by a wood fire. The other three ferrymen were in the hut. Simeon, who was an old man of about sixty, skinny and toothless, but broad-shouldered and healthy, was drunk. He would long ago have gone to bed, but he had a bottle in his pocket and was afraid of his comrades asking him for vodka. The Tartar was ill and miserable, and pulling his rags about him, he went on talking about the good things in the province of Simbirsk and what a beautiful and clever wife he had left at home. He was not more than twenty-five, and now, by the light of the wood fire, with his pale, sorrowful, sickly face, he looked a mere boy. "'Of course, it is not a paradise here,' said Brains. "'You see, water, the bare bushes by the river, clay everywhere, nothing else.' It is long past Easter, and there is still ice on the water, and this morning there was snow. "'Bad, bad!' said the Tartar, with a frightened look. A few yards away flowed the dark, cold river, muttering, dashing against the holes in the clayey banks as it tore along to the distant sea. By the bank they were sitting on loomed a great barge, which the ferrymen call a carbass. Far away and away, flashing out, flaring up, were fires crawling like snakes, last year's grass being burned. And behind the water again was darkness. Little banks of ice could be heard knocking against the barge. It was very damp and cold. The Tartar glanced at the sky. There were as many stars as at home, and the darkness was the same. But something was missing. At home in the Simbirsk province the stars and the skies were altogether different. "'Bad! Bad!' he repeated. "'You will get used to it,' said Brains, with a laugh. "'You are young yet, and foolish. The milk is hardly dry on your lips, and in your folly you imagine that there is no one unhappier than you. But there will come a time when you will say, "'God give every one such a life!' Just look at me. In a week's time the floods will be gone, and we will fix the ferry here, and all of you will go away into Siberia, and I shall stay here, going to and fro. I have been living thus for the past two and twenty years, but thank God I want nothing. God give everybody such a life. The Tartar threw some branches into the fire, crawled near it, and said, My father is sick. When he dies, my mother and my wife promise to come here. "'What do you want your mother and your wife for?' asked Brains. "'Just foolishness, my friend. It's the devil tempting you. Plague take him. Don't listen to the evil one. Don't give way to him. When he talks to you about women, you should answer him sharply, I don't want them. When he talks of freedom, you should stick to it and say, I don't want it, I want nothing, no father, no mother, no wife, no freedom, no home, no love, I want nothing. Plague, take them all. Brains took a swig at his bottle and went on. My brother, I am not an ordinary peasant. I don't come from the servile masses. I am the son of a deacon, and when I was a free man in Rursk, I used to wear a frock coat and now I have brought myself to such a point that I can sleep naked on the ground and eat grass. God gives such a life to everybody. I want nothing. I am afraid of nobody, and I think there is no man richer or freer than I. When they sent me here from Russia, I set my teeth at once and said, I want nothing. The devil whispers to me about my wife and my kindred, and about freedom, and I say to him, I want nothing. I stuck to it, and, you see, I live happily, and have nothing to grumble at. If a man gives the devil the least opportunity, and listens to him just once, then he is lost, and he has no hope of salvation. He will be over ears in the mire, and will never get out. 
not only peasants the like of you are lost but the nobly born and the educated also about fifteen years ago a certain nobleman was sent here from russia he had had some trouble with his brothers and had made a forgery in a will people said he was a prince or a baron but perhaps he was only a high official who knows well he came here and at once bought a house and land in Moltzik. i want to live by my own work said he in the sweat of my brow because i am no longer a nobleman but an exile why said i god help you for that is good he was a young man then ardent and eager he used to mow and go fishing and he would ride sixty miles on horseback only one thing was wrong from the very beginning he was always driving to the post office at girin he used to sit in my boat and sigh ah simeon it is a long time since they sent me any money from home you are better without money vasily sergnevich said i what's the good of it you just throw away the past as though it had never happened as though it were only a dream and start life afresh don't listen to the devil i said he won't do you any good and he will only tighten the noose you want money now but in a little while you will want something else and then more and more if said i you want to be happy you must want nothing exactly if i said fate has been hard on you and me it is no good asking her for charity and falling at her feet we must ignore her and laugh at her that's what i said to him two years later i ferried him over and he rubbed his hands and laughed i'm going said he to girin to meet my wife she has taken pity on me she says and she is coming here she is very kind and good and he gave a gasp of joy then one day he came with his wife a beautiful young lady with a little girl in her arms and a lot of luggage and vasily andreich kept turning and looking at her and could not look at her or praise her enough yes simeon my friend even in siberia people live well thought i all right you won't be content and from that time on mark you he used to go to garin every week to find out if money had been sent from russia a terrible lot of money was wasted she stays here said he for my sake and her youth and beauty wither away here in siberia she shares my bitter lot with me said he and i must give her all the pleasure i can for it to make his wife happier he took up with the officials and any kind of rubbish and they couldn't have company without giving food and drink and they must have a piano and a fluffy little dog on the sofa bad cess to it luxury in a word all kinds of tricks my lady did not stay with him long how could she clay water cold no vegetables no fruit uneducated people and drunkards with no manners and she was a pretty pampered young lady from the metropolis of course she got bored and her husband was no longer a gentleman but an exile quite a different matter three years later i remember on the eve of the assumption i heard shouts from the other bank i went over in the ferry and saw my lady all wrapped up with a young gentleman a government official in a troika i ferried them across they got into the carriage and disappeared and i saw no more of them toward morning vasily andreich came racing up in a coach and pair has my wife been across simeon with a gentleman in spectacles she has said i but you might as well look for the wind in the fields he raced after them and kept it up for five days and nights when he came back he jumped on to the ferry and began to knock his head against the side and to cry aloud you see said i there you are and i laughed and reminded him even in siberia people live but he went on beating his head harder than ever then he got the desire for freedom his wife had gone to russia and he longed to go there to see her and take her away from her lover 
and he began to go to the post office every day, and then to the authorities of the town. He was always sending applications, or personally handing them to the authorities, asking to have his term remitted and to be allowed to go, and he told me that he had spent over two hundred roubles on telegrams. He sold his land and mortgaged his house to the money-lenders. His hair went grey, he grew round-shouldered, and his face got yellow and consumptive-looking. He used to cough whenever he spoke, and tears used to come to his eyes. He spent eight years on his applications, and at last he became happy again and lively. He had thought of a new dodge. His daughter, you see, had grown up. He doted on her, and could never take his eyes off her. And, indeed, she was very pretty, dark, and clever. Every Sunday he used to go to church with her at Guerin. They would stand side by side on the ferry, and she would smile, and he would devour her with his eyes. Yes, Simeon, he would say, even in Siberia people live. Even in Siberia there is happiness. Look what a fine daughter I have! You wouldn't find one like her in a thousand miles' journey. Oh, she's a nice girl, said I. Oh, yes. And I thought to myself, you wait, she is young. Young blood will have its way. She wants to live, and what life is there here? And she began to pine away. Wasting, wasting away, she withered away, fell ill, and had to keep to her bed. Consumption. That's Siberian happiness. Plague, take it. That's Siberian life. He rushed all over the place after the doctors and dragged them home with him. If he heard of a doctor or a quack three hundred miles off, he would rush off after him. He spent a terrific amount of money on doctors, and I think it would have been much better spent on drink. All the same she had to die. No help for it. Then it was all up to him. He thought of hanging himself, and of trying to escape to Russia. That would be the end of him. He would try to escape. He would be caught, tried, penal servitude, flogging. Good, good, muttered the Tartar with a shiver. What is good? asked Brains. Wife and daughter. What does penal servitude and suffering matter? He saw his wife and his daughter. You say one should want nothing. But nothing is evil. His wife spent three years with him. God gave him that. Nothing is evil, and three years is good. Why don't you understand that? Trembling and stammering as he groped for Russian words, of which he knew only a few, the Tartar began to say, God forbid he should fall ill among strangers, and die, and be buried in the cold, sodden earth. And then, if his wife could come to him, if only for one day, or even for one hour, he would gladly endure any torture for such happiness, and would even thank God. Better one day of happiness than nothing. Then once more he said what a beautiful, clever wife he had left at home, and with his head in his hands he began to cry, and assured Simeon that he was innocent and had been falsely accused. His two brothers and his uncle had stolen some horses from a peasant, and beat the old man nearly to death, and the community never looked into the matter at all, and judgment was passed by which all three brothers were exiled to Siberia, while his uncle, a rich man, remained at home. "'You will get used to it,' said Simeon. The Tartar relapsed into silence and stared into the fire with his eyes red from weeping. He looked perplexed and frightened, as if he could not understand why he was in the cold and the darkness among strangers, and not in the province of Simbirsk. Brains lay down near the fire, smiled at something, and began to say in an undertone, "'But what joy she must be to your father,' he muttered after a pause. He loves her, and she is a comfort to him, eh? But, my man, don't tell me. He is a strict, harsh old man, and girls don't want strictness. They want kisses and laughter, scents and pomade. Yes, ah, oh, what a life! 
Simeon swore heavily. No more vodka. That means bedtime. What? I'm going, my man. Left alone, the Tartar threw more branches on the fire, lay down, and, looking into the blaze, began to think of his native village and of his wife. If she could come, if only for a month, or even a day, and then, if she liked, go back again. Better a month, or even a day, than nothing. But even if his wife kept her promise and came, how could he provide for her? Where was she to live? If there is nothing to eat, how are we to live? asked the Tartar aloud. For working at the oars day and night, he was paid two kopecks a day. The passengers gave tips, but the ferryman shared them out and gave nothing to the Tartar, and only laughed at him. And he was poor, cold, hungry, and fearful. With his whole body aching and shivering, he thought it would be good to go into the hut and sleep. But there was nothing to cover himself with, and it was colder there than on the bank. He had nothing to cover himself with there, but he could make up a fire. In a week's time, when the floods had subsided and the ferry would be fixed up, all the ferrymen except Simeon would not be wanted any longer, and the Tartar would have to go from village to village, begging and looking for work. His wife was only seventeen, beautiful, soft, and shy. Could she go, unveiled, begging through the villages? No, the idea of it was horrible. It was already dawn. The barges, the bushy willows above the water, the swirling flood began to take shape, and up above in a clayey cliff a hut thatched with straw, and above that the straggling houses of the village, where the cocks had begun to crow. The ginger-coloured clay cliff, the barge, the river, the strange wild people, hunger, cold, illness, perhaps all these things did not really exist. Perhaps, thought the Tartar, it was only a dream. He felt that he must be asleep, and he heard his own snoring. Certainly he was at home in the Simbursk province. He had but to call his wife, and she would answer, and his mother was in the next room. But what awful dreams there are! Why, the Tartar smiled and opened his eyes. What river was that? The Volga? It was snowing. Hi, fairy! Someone shouted on the other bank. Carbos! The Tartar woke and went to fetch his mates to row over to the other side. Hurrying into their sheepskins, swearing sleepily in hoarse voices, and shivering from the cold, the four men appeared on the bank. After their sleep, the river from which there came a piercing blast seemed to them horrible and disgusting. They stepped slowly into the barge. The Tartar and the three ferrymen took the long, broad-bladed oars, which in the dim light looked like a crab's claw, and Simeon flung himself with his belly against the tiller. And on the other side the voice kept on shouting, and a revolver was fired twice, for the man probably thought the ferrymen were asleep or gone to the village inn. "'All right, plenty of time,' said Brains, in the tone of one who was convinced that there is no need for hurry in this world, and indeed there is no reason for it. The heavy, clumsy barge left the bank and heaved through the willows, and by the willows slowly receding it was possible to tell that the barge was moving. The ferryman plied the oars with a slow, measured stroke. Brains hung over the tiller with his stomach pressed against it and swung from side to side. In the dim light they looked like men sitting on some antediluvian animal with long limbs, swimming out to a cold, dismal, nightmare country. They got clear of the willows and swung out into midstream. The thud of the oars and the splash could be heard on the other bank, and shouts came, Quicker! Quicker! After another ten minutes the barge bumped heavily against the landing stage. And it is still snowing, snowing all the time, Simeon murmured, wiping the snow off his face. God knows where it comes from. 
On the other side, a tall, lean old man was waiting in a short fox fur coat and a white astrakhan hat. He was standing some distance from his horses and did not move. He had a stern, concentrated expression, as if he were trying to remember something and were furious with his recalcitrant memory. When Simeon went up to him and took off his hat with a smile, he said, I'm in a hurry to get to Anastreska. My daughter is worse again, and they tell me there's a new doctor at Anastreska. The coach was clamped onto the barge, and they rode back. All the while, as they rode, the man, whom Simeon called Vasily Andreitch, stood motionless, pressing his thick lips tight and staring in front of him. When the driver craved leave to smoke in his presence, he answered nothing, as if he did not hear, and Simeon hung over the rudder and looked at him mockingly and said, "'Even in Siberia people live. L-I-V-E.' On Brain's face was a triumphant expression, as if he were proving something, as if pleased that things had happened just as he thought they would. The unhappy, helpless look of the man in the fox fur coat seemed to give him great pleasure. "'The roads are muddy now, Vasily Andreitch,' he said, when the horses had been harnessed on the bank. "'You'd better wait a couple of weeks until it gets drier. If there were any point in going—' but you know yourself that people are always on the move day and night, and there's no point in it, sure. Vasily Andreitch said nothing, gave him a tip, took his seat in the coach, and drove away. Look, he's gone galloping after the doctor, said Simeon, shivering in the cold. Yes, to look for a real doctor, trying to overtake the wind in the fields, and catch the devil by the tail. Plague take him. What queer fish there are. God forgive me, a miserable sinner. The Tartar went up to Brains, and, looking at him with mingled hatred and disgust, trembling, and mixing Tartar words up with his broken Russian, said, He good, good, and you, bad, you are bad. The gentleman is a good soul, very good, and you are a beast, you are bad. The gentleman is alive, and you are dead. God made man that he should be alive, that he should have happiness, sorrow, grief, and you want nothing, so you are not alive, but a stone. A stone wants nothing, and so do you. You are a stone, and God does not love you, and the gentleman he does. They all began to laugh. The Tartar furiously knit his brows, waved his hand, drew his rags round him, and went to the fire. The ferryman and Simeon went slowly to the hut. "'It's cold,' said one of the ferrymen hoarsely, as he stretched himself on the straw with which the damp clay floor was covered. "'Yes, it's not warm,' another agreed. "'It's a hard life.' All of them lay down. The wind blew the door open. The snow drifted into the hut. Nobody could bring himself to get up and shut the door. It was cold, but they put up with it. "'And I am happy,' muttered Simeon, as he fell asleep. "'God gives such a life to everybody.' "'You certainly are the devil's own. Even the devil don't need to take you.' Sounds like the barking of a dog came from outside. "'Who is that?' Who is there? It's the Tartar crying. Oh, he's a queer fish. He'll get used to it, said Simeon, and at once he fell asleep. Soon the others slept too, and the door was left open. End of story four.